Members of the Board of Visitors, students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Nearly 200 years after the university's founding, we affirm Mr. Jefferson's faith in the potential of education to advance the human condition. We recall that he said, if the condition of man is to be progressively ameliorated, as we fondly hope and believe, education is to be the chief instrument of effecting it. Today we acknowledge that our students have engaged in rigorous learning and reasoned discourse in the classroom and beyond. With their talents and their education, they are equipped to set things right in the world. This afternoon, we confirm academic achievement in awarding intermediate honors to 421 women and men who, during their first two years here, have distinguished themselves in the classroom. These students have committed themselves to the pursuit of scholarship in the manner envisioned by Thomas Jefferson when he opened the university in 1825. Today, we also present the university's highest award, the Thomas Jefferson Award, to two members of our community who in character, influence, and life work exemplify the principles on which this institution was founded. We are honored to have as our speaker today Ms. Risa Gayaboff. Ms. Gayaboff is the 12th Dean of the University of Virginia School of Law and the first woman to hold the position. Ms. Gayaboff is a nationally recognized historian who focuses on the history of civil rights, labor, and constitutional law in the 20th century. A native of New York, Ms. Gayaboff became interested in studying about the South, particularly the civil rights movement, while attending Harvard College, where she graduated summa cum laude and majored in history and sociology. Through extracurricular activities, Ms. Gayaboff became active in public service and social justice. She discovered that becoming a lawyer would enable her to create change. And in 2000, she earned a Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School. After clerking for Judge Guido Calabresi of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and Justice Stephen G. Breyer of the U.S. Supreme Court, Ms. Gayaboff became interested in a career in the academy. To her, being a law professor fulfilled her scholarly interests and also her desire to make change in the world. She joined the UVA faculty in 2002 and completed her PhD in history from Princeton University in 2003. Ms. Gayaboff has authored many books. Her most recent book, Vagrant Nation, Police Power, Constitutional Change, and the Making of the 1960s, was published this year. The University of Virginia is grateful for Risa's dedication, and we are fortunate to have her as our speaker today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Risa Gayaboff. <clears throat> President Sullivan, Vice Presidents, fellow deans, faculty, members of the Board of Visitors, and most especially, the students we honor today and their proud and happy parents and family. I am so honored to address you. What a wonderful occasion this is, a time to celebrate your achievements, 
to celebrate the support of your families, your faculty mentors and professors, and to celebrate what we do here at the University of Virginia. We educate and inspire, and, and inspire an incredibly diverse and talented student body. We come from different backgrounds, we have different views, interests, hopes, and dreams, and we come here together in the spirit of intellectual curiosity, respect, and community across those differences. We come to learn not only from the faculty, but from one another. That is a tall order, and it is not always easy, but it is the aspiration that defines us, and it is a deeply worthy goal, both in and of itself, and because it is central to preparing our students to emerge ready for the world. So in that respect, I am delighted to be part of this celebration, as I am delighted to be part of this unique intellectual and educational endeavor. In preparing for today, I listened to the past convocation speeches that are available online, and I also read and watched a whole bunch of commencement speeches. And I decided that convocation is so much better than commencement. And that's because this is a very special moment. You are still in the midst of your education. You are still thinking about the rest of your time here. So it provides an opportunity for me to offer thoughts not only about your lives after college, but also how to use the precious time you still have here. So I want to address you along three different dimensions. First, as the regular people that you are. Second, and in my recruiting capacity as dean of the law school, I want to talk about the power of lawyers, the power you can wield as lawyers, as something of a plug for attending law school generally, and UVA law school in particular. I considered but rejected the idea of spending my whole speech on that. Uh, but, but it would be, I think, malpractice if I didn't at least try to recruit some of this esteemed group. Third and finally, I will address you as the future professionals and leaders of all kinds that you will one day become. Because I know that even after my best efforts, many of you will still choose another career path, and that is very much as it should be. As a legal historian, a scholar of legal change, and a scholar of change more broadly, I ask myself often, how does change happen, and who makes it happen? So for much of my speech today, I will draw on my own scholarship and my own perspective as a law school dean and a longtime law professor to offer some thoughts about how things change, the part you can and should play in a changing nation and world in each of these three capacities, and how you can prepare yourselves over the next two years to play that role. So first, the role you play as regular people. Much of my scholarship is about how regular people make change in the world. And I want to tell you about two of them taken from the book that President Sullivan mentioned, Vagrant Nation. The first is a man named Isidore Edelman. Isidore Edelman was a soapbox orator in 1940s Los Angeles. This was not just some occasional spouting from a street corner. Every day, Isidore Edelman got on a bus from one part of Los Angeles and took it all the way across the city to get to Pershing Square, where soapbox orators tended to talk. And he would get up on a park bench and talk for hours at a time. In the case that I'm going to talk about in a minute, people testified that they listened to him talk for upwards of 800 hours. It's a lot of hours. Edelman frequently got arrested because this was the late 1940s. That's the Cold War. This is Los Angeles. And Isidore Edelman was a communist. Well, that's not quite right. Isidore Edelman had been a communist until he was kicked out of the Communist Party for being too much of a pain. He was actually kicked out of most of the organizations that he joined, but he was lefty in his thinking, and he talked a lot about politics and economics. And that led, in Cold War America, to arrests. Arrests for things like littering, soliciting funds, and my favorite, defacing a park bench by standing on it. That's the big concrete kind. Eventually, he was arrested for vagrancy. You may not be familiar with vagrancy. I, I guarantee you will be familiar with vagrancy by the end of the speech. But vagrancy laws came from medieval and Elizabethan England to the American colonies. They criminalized being poor and idle, wandering about with no apparent purpose, being immoral, or being suspicious. There was one law on the books in 1972 that began 
rogues and vagabonds and dissolute persons who go about begging. Now, I know that 1972 probably sounds like a long time ago to those of you being honored today, but this was antiquated language, even for 1972. These laws existed in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. They were used regularly against anyone like Isidore Edelman, who seemed out of place for any reason, politically, culturally, socially, racially, in terms of their sexual orientation. And they were so broad and so vague. I mean, what does it mean to be immoral? What makes a person suspicious? That they were used all the time and required virtually no evidence of criminal wrongdoing whatsoever. The vagrancy law in California in the late 1940s made a vagrant of anyone who was dissolute. Dissolute meant lawless. Since Isidore Edelman had been arrested before, he must be lawless, therefore dissolute, and he was arrested for vagrancy. He was made a vagrant because of his unpopular speech. So after a nine-day trial for vagrancy and a conviction, he brought his case all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. The court initially agreed to hear his case, but then they punted. They were not quite sure what to make of vagrancy laws yet. This is the first case that they were hearing, and they weren't sure what to do with it. And they did something called digging in the business. They dismissed the case as improvidently granted, digged the case. Even so, Isidore Edelman set in motion a 20-year process that would lead the Supreme Court to the invalidation of vagrancy laws, and more generally, to their loss of legitimacy and their disuse. To me, Isidore Edelman represents the power of the regular person to change the world. He stood up for his rights, and things changed. Now, you might discount him. You might say, he's not a regular person. He was a politically active and empowered person. He'd been a member of the Communist Party, after all. So I'll tell you a story of a second person, a second regular person, who helped change the world. His name is Sam Thompson, and he came to be known as Shuffling Sam Thompson. Sam Thompson was a handyman and a junk peddler. He was poor, African-American, and an alcoholic. And he lived his whole life in Louisville, Kentucky. He was arrested frequently in the 1950s for vagrancy, loitering, and public drunkenness. This was just his life and the way things went. And it was how the police dealt with people like him. They had the power under vagrancy laws to arrest anyone, and the anyones were often like Sam Thompson, people without a lot of power themselves. Until one day, Sam Thompson was arrested under circumstances that he thought weren't quite right, and he decided to push back. He decided he would not go one more time to the Louisville Police Court where there were no procedures, there were no lawyers, there were no transcripts, there were no appeals, and he would quickly be convicted and placed in jail for a short stay. Instead, he went to the man who employed him as a handyman one day a week, and here he got lucky. This man was a member of the board of the Kentucky Civil Liberties Union, and he put Sam Thompson in touch with a man named Louis Lusky. Louis Lusky had fancy, pedigreed credentials. He was first in his class at Columbia Law School. He was a Supreme Court law clerk. And Louis Lusky went with Sam Thompson to the police court. No one at the police court had ever seen the likes of Louis Lusky. And he arrives with motions and briefs and constitutional arguments. And the prosecutor actually said, I didn't know people actually said this except in movies, your honor, he's making a federal case out of this. <laughs> and after that, the police harassment of Sam Thompson got worse because he had dared to fight back. And now every time he went to the bus station, which he did frequently because he lived far on the outskirts of town, he was arrested. And so he stopped waiting for his bus at the bus station. He decided to wait near a bus stop at a black bar called the Liberty End Cafe. It doesn't get better than this for a historian. It's at the end of Liberty Street, the Liberty End Cafe. And the police went there looking for him, and they arrested him for the 55th time as he ate some macaroni and shuffled his feet to the jukebox. And this is where his nickname comes from. There was a long discussion at the Supreme Court whether he was dancing or shuffling or doing a shuffle dance and whether that was allowed in this particular bar and whether it could justify his arrest. So Thompson and Lusky brought his case all the way up to the Supreme Court, which reversed his conviction. But once again, they weren't sure what to do about vagrancy laws. So they left those laws on the books, but they vindicated Sam Thompson. 
Thompson is not like Isidore, Isidore Edelman. He had little education. He had little political support. But he still knew when an injustice had been done. He fought back. He found resources. And he put change in motion. I could tell you so many more stories if we had the time. Stories of Joy Kelly, a young hippie arrested for vagrancy in the crash pad that she rented with her friends in late 1960s Charlotte. Or Martin Hershorn, who was arrested in his own home wearing only a half slip and a brassiere under a law that made anyone masquerading so as to disguise their identity a vagrant. Regular people in virtually every social movement of the 1960s challenged vagrancy laws. African Americans and other civil rights activists, communists like Edelman, Isidore, uh, Isidore Edelman, labor union members, poor people, beats, hippies, gay men, lesbians, and other sexual minorities, women, Vietnam War protesters, student activists, young urban minority men, and other dissidents. This was no coincidence. All these people had been regulated by vagrancy laws because they seemed out of place in some way. And they all became, in the 1960s, organized and assertive. And what they found was that vagrancy laws were obstacles to their other goals of sexual freedom or racial equality or political protest. These regular people exercising power brought down a 400-year-old legal regime that was used in virtually every city and state in the nation by experiencing a harm, calling it an injustice, and determining to make change happen. So when I say that I am addressing you as regular people, I mean it as a compliment. Many people assume that the answer to the question of how constitutional change happens is either by constitutional amendment or by judicial decree. But judges only decide the cases that come to them, which means that regular people have enormous power to identify problems, bring cases, and seek change. It is not always easy, and it takes a lot of courage, but it can be done. You all have this power as people in the world, not just in the law, but in every realm. It's the kind of power that you can, should, and will exercise in many of the stories of your lives. You are all regular people, but you also occupy a unique and rarefied position in society. By your presence at this university, and especially at this ceremony, you have already proven that you are people of unusual talents and abilities. That is what brought you to this day, and you have clearly taken advantage of the opportunities that this great university has offered you, which means that you have knowledge and privilege that most people don't have to add to your abilities and power as regular people. So in some respects, you are less like Isidore Edelman, Sam Thompson, Joy Kelly, or Martin Hershorn, and more like others in this story, and you've probably guessed who. The lawyers. The lawyers who, as they chose to do, augmented the power of these regular people. So we come now to the second part of these remarks, addressing you as future potential lawyers. For as much as it was the case that it was everyday people who exercised power in individual cases, it was also lawyers who figured out how to make them into constitutional claims that would resonate with judges. Lawyers who acted as translators, mediators, and even gatekeepers between the harms experienced in the world and formal changes in the law. Vagrancy had been standard procedure in policing for so long that no one, other than those arrested, had taken notice of it. It was a bedrock of American criminal law. And when so-called vagrants began to push back and have the sense that this was problematic, their lawyers found ways to make that problem not only politically visible, but also legally cognizable. The lawyers who stood up for their clients began with discrete problems brought to them by people in discrete circumstances. And they saw connections between them. They constructed a category called vagrancy law as its own legal problem that affected different people in so many different walks of life. And they created arguments about why those laws were unconstitutional. These were lawyers like Louis Lusky, who I've already mentioned, like Al Weirin and his law partner, Fred Okrand. They represented our soapbox orator, Isidore Edelman. They were affiliated with the Southern California ACLU. 
And as far back as the 1930s, Al Weirin had already been challenging vagrancy cases on the grounds, uh, on behalf of farm workers who were trying to organize in 1930s Depression California against growers. As late as 1983, Fred Okrand was still challenging vagrancy-related cases used against an African-American man who walked around white neighborhoods and was arrested. So between them, Weirin and Okrand spanned a half century of vagrancy challenges on behalf of clients as different as farm workers, communists, and African-Americans. Also, lawyers like Anthony Amsterdam who published a paper while still in law school in 1960 that would stru structure much of the lawyerly and judicial thinking about vagrancy laws for a decade. He moved between the academy and legal practice, working mostly with the NAACP, but also with the ACLU. And he brought his vagrancy law expertise to bear in the civil rights struggle, the Vietnam War protests, and criminal procedure cases. These and other lawyers augmented the power of regular people, brought their professional learning into play, and transformed injustice into constitutional claim. What is striking about these lawyers, for the most part, is that they are not famous, they are not unique. They are not just Thurgood Marshall or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They were not just affiliated with the NAACP or the ACLU. They were just as often in private practice on their own or in law firms. They did this on top of their other work, pro bono, for the good of the public and in their spare time. All lawyers wield this power, the power to make law, to affect real people, institutions, companies, and nations. The law unlocks doors, and it enforces contracts. It puts people in prison and gets them out again. It allows for treaties and ends wars. It merges companies or allows them to go bankrupt. It does not do any of these things on its own, without lawyers. The law is not some constant external foreign thing that exists in a vacuum out there. Law is made, not found, and it is made by people. If you decide to go to law school, how could you not now after this, it will eventually routinely and momentously be made by you. That is both the power of the law and its awesome responsibility. The law affords opportunities that come with obligation because lawyers magnify the power of regular people and because they hold a public trust. Lawyers all the time use their privilege, power, and knowledge to help people every day. That is why I became a lawyer and that is why I now train them. I could go on, but I won't. I know how varied your interests are and how varied your career paths, so I understand if you don't want to become lawyers. You can come to law school and become judges or mayors or senators or CEOs or ambassadors instead. I'm just kidding, but really our graduates have done all those things and more. I do accept that many of you will not become lawyers, and that's why the third and final dimension that I want to speak to you about is as future professionals and leaders of all kinds. It is not only the law that is made by people. This world is made by courageous people, by regular people who you are and always will be, and by the leaders you are going to become. Leaders and professionals with power, knowledge, privilege, opportunity, and yes, responsibility to use all that with and on behalf of other people. As engineers, nurses, computer scientists, politicians, teachers, hedge fund managers, historians, entrepreneurs, physicists, architects, and more. That you are sitting here today means the following. You have worked hard. You are extraordinarily talented. You are now, even if you have not always been, incredibly privileged to be a part of this great university, to have at your fingertips resources of every kind. This university and these opportunities bind you to the kind of public trust I have been talking about in every arena. You are poised for greatness and leadership, which means opportunity and recognition that we all bear responsibility for the world we inhabit. I say poised and not done, and here, is where convocation is so much better than commencement. You still have almost two years of your education left. How lucky you are, how exciting. 
If you accept any of what I have just said, how should you use that time? At the most general level, I would say use it actively and self-reflectively. You are active participants in your own education. This is a partnership intended to achieve mastery. You are not passive recipients or consumers of information. In my view, there are three types of learning that go on in law school. And those three types of learning, I think, can be generally applied across the educational spectrum. First are the fundamentals. For lawyers, those fundamentals are analytical reasoning, analyzing problems, what people refer to as thinking like a lawyer, learning to persuade rather than disagree. The fundamentals are different in every subject, but every subject has them. Fundamentals of analysis, experimentation, interpretation, creativity, critical thinking, and disciplinary method. Learn those, know those. They are your bedrock on which you will build in any direction you eventually choose to go in. But you also must go beyond fundamentals. So the second type of learning you should endeavor to experience is experiential learning that teaches integrity, responsibility, and judgment. In the law school, experiential learning takes the form of clinics, externships, negotiations classes, legal research, and writing. For you, there are so many possibilities. They are truly boundless. Within your curriculum, they are labs and internships and hands-on learning experiences. They are also extracurricular and co-curricular activities. Student self-government, Madison House, summer jobs, mentoring programs, study abroad. These experiences enable you to see the real world, to make decisions with real consequences, to get to know people who are very different from you and interact with them with openness and empathy, to see the need and the opportunity for service as well as gain, and to learn humility. The humility of the limits of your education and knowledge, the humility of knowing in your bones the power, knowledge, and humanity of every person in the world. The third and final part of your education should be comprised of courses that open your eyes in other ways. You should endeavor to take a wide array of scholarly perspectives that foster the big picture thinking that is critical to leadership in any field. Don't limit yourself to your major or even your two or three majors. Don't limit yourself to the immediately practical or the straight and narrow of any given path. Take classes that put both the basic principles of your chosen field and the real world interpersonal experiences you will have into perspective. Why is this deal on the table now? Why has this social movement erupted into the public spotlight now? Why do we need to solve this problem at this time? In other words, whatever you are studying, study something else too. Whether you know now where you are headed or not, life will always take you in unexpected directions. So get the big picture and prepare yourself for the long view for the leadership that will come. If you do all of this, you will learn to think not only about gaining, accessing, and using the knowledge you have, but also taking ownership over what knowledge most fundamentally is. You will learn to think not only about what needs to be done, but what can or should be done, not only to follow, but to lead. This is what Isadora Edelman and Sam Thompson did with far fewer resources than you have. It is what hundreds and thousands of brave Americans of different races, classes, sexes, sexual orientations, gender identities, religions, political stripes, and cultural commitments did as they challenged vagrancy laws and other injustices, what their lawyers helped them to do. All of those thousands of people chose to lead rather than follow, and they succeeded. In 1972, the Supreme Court struck down that antiquated vagrancy law that I quoted to you earlier. Now, many of you are probably thinking, I still see policing problems similar to this one in the world. And I see, still see intolerance for difference. That is so true. It's a debate for another day to talk about the dynamics, pace, and permanence of change, to think about the role of courts and law in that change. But for now, I will say, change is never complete, and that does not make it any the less worthwhile. I want to leave you with, with what Justice William O. Douglas wrote in the opinion he wrote striking down vagrancy laws. Douglas was not a perfect man. None of us is perfect. But as a Supreme Court justice for 36 years, he never stopped describing himself as a vagrant in his youth. It's not clear whether this was true. But he talked about hiking on the open road. He talked about being 
a man of the people. He kept correspondence with an organization called the Hobos of America, which made him an honorary knight of the open road as he served as a Supreme Court justice. He wrote books that railed against the establishment. The man was the establishment, okay. But this opinion was so close to his heart. It's the opinion in 36 years of being a Supreme Court justice that he wanted read at his funeral along with the singing of the song, This Land is Your Land. He wrote in this opinion about how vagrancy laws quash quintessential American feelings of, quote, independence and self-confidence, the feeling of creativity. He venerated, quote, the right to dissent, the right to be nonconformists, and the right to defy submissiveness. He talked about encouraging, quote, lives of high spirits rather than hushed, suffocating silence. Those are my wishes for you. On this happy and momentous occasion, embrace your knowledge as your power, seize the opportunities you have worked hard to create for yourselves, remember always the public trust that you hold in your hands, and live lives of self-confidence and creativity, lives that defy submissiveness, and speak where there would otherwise be silence. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you so very much. The Executive Vice President and Provost of the University. Let me just say thank you, Dean Golubov, for that inspiring speech. Even I'm ready to sign up for law school. <laughs> Good afternoon. Before President Sul Sullivan awards intermediate honors, I would like to take a moment to recognize those faculty members who received teaching awards this year. All of the teaching award recipients are listed in the back of your program. I will ask these award recipients to stand and remain standing as I read their names. Please hold your applause until the entire group has been introduced, and then please let them know how much we appreciate our best teachers. With us this afternoon are recipients of the All University Teaching Award. Toby J. Heitens, Bradley W. Reed, Laura L. Serbulia, the Alumni Association Distinguished Professor Award recipient, J. N. Hertel, Excellence in Faculty Mentoring Award, Kirk Martini, NEH Richard A. and Sarah Page Mayo Distinguished Teaching Professor, James E. Seitz, recipient of the Corey Family Teaching Award, Aaron M. Lambert. We commend all of you. Thank you for your many contributions to the university. Now please join me in showing them how much we appreciate their outstanding teaching. President of the University. It is a pleasure for me, on behalf of the faculty, to confer intermediate honors on the undergraduate students who have attained this distinction during their first two years at the University. Many academic awards are given to undergraduates at the end of their study here. Intermediate honors, however, are awarded at the beginning of the third undergraduate year to those students who are in the top 20% of their class while carrying a full course load during their first four semesters at the university. This is a recognition of significant academic achievement, and I, along with the faculty, share their parents' pride in what these students have accomplished. I will now ask the Grand Marshal to introduce the deans or their representatives of the School of Architecture, the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, the Curry School of Education, the School of Engineering and Applied Science, and the School of Nursing, who will present the candidates for the award of intermediate honors. Dean of the School of Architecture,
The candidates for intermediate honors in the School of Architecture will please rise and remain standing. Madam President, I have the honor to present for the award of intermediate honors these candidates from the School of Architecture who are in the top 20% of those students who have remained in good academic standing and completed at least 60 credits during their first two years at the university. The award of intermediate honors is the highest honor that an undergraduate can earn during the first two years at the university. In officially conferring this distinction upon you, I offer congratulations on your outstanding academic achievement in the School of Architecture, and I challenge you to deepen your appreciation for the best of the past, even as you learn to design and sustain the human environment for the future. Please be seated. The Dean of the College of Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. The candidates for intermediate honors in the College of Arts and Sciences will please rise and remain standing. Madam President, I have the honor to present for the award of intermediate honors these candidates from the College of Arts and Sciences who are in the top 20% of those students who have remained in good academic standing and completed at least 60 credits during their first two years at the university. The award of intermediate honors is the highest honor that an undergraduate can earn during the first two years at the university. In officially conferring this distinction upon you, I offer congratulations on your outstanding academic achievement in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I challenge you to continue to strive for excellence in the study of arts and sciences that undergird all meaningful learning. Please be seated. The Associate Dean of the Curry School of Education. The candidates for intermediate honors in the Curry School of Education will rise and remain standing. Madam President, I have the honor to present for the award of intermediate honors these candidates from the Curry School of Education who are in the top 20% of those students who have remained in good academic standing and completed at least 60 credits during their first two years at the university. The award of intermediate honors is the highest honor that an undergraduate can earn during the first two years at the university. In officially conferring this distinction upon you, I offer congratulations on your outstanding academic achievement in the Curry School of Education, and I challenge you to continue developing the knowledge and skills that will enable you to enrich the lives of those you will serve in your professions. Please be seated. The Associate Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. The candidates for intermediate honors in the School of Engineering and Applied Science will rise and remain standing. Madam President, I have the honor to present for the award of intermediate honors these candidates from the School of Engineering and Applied Science who are in the top 20% of those who have remained in good academic standard and completed at least 60 credits during the first two years at the university. The award of intermediate honors is the highest honor that an undergraduate can earn during the first two years at the university. In officially conferring this distinction upon you, I offer congratulations on your outstanding academic achievement in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And I challenge you to continue building the knowledge that transforms the theoretical to the practical and uses the practical for the benefit of humankind. Please be seated. The Dean of the School of Nursing 
The candidates for intermediate honors in the School of Nursing will please rise and remain standing. Madam President, I have the honor to present for the award of intermediate honors these candidates from the School of Nursing who are in the top 20 percent of those students who have remained in good academic standing and completed at least 60 credits during their first two years at the university. The award of intermediate honors is the highest honor that an undergraduate can earn during the first two years at the university. In officially conferring this distinction upon you, I offer congratulations on your outstanding academic achievement in the School of Nursing, and I challenge you to expand and deepen your knowledge of the healing arts and sciences. Please be seated. Thank you, and may we have another hand for all of our undergraduates who've earned intermediate honors. The Thomas Jefferson Award is the most prestigious honor the university presents to faculty members, and the list of recipients includes some of the university's most distinguished teachers and scholars. This year, we are presenting two Thomas Jefferson Awards. The original award was established in 1955 through the generosity of the Robert Earl McConnell Foundation and is intended to recognize excellence in service. In 2009, the Alumni Board of Trustees of the University of Virginia Endowment Fund established a second award to recognize excellence in scholarship. The recipients are selected by a committee that reports to the provost. It is my privilege to announce that the Thomas Jefferson Award Committee has selected Jerome McGann, the John Stuart Bryan Professor of English, to receive the Thomas Jefferson Award recognizing excellence in scholarship. I will now read the citation. Jerome McCann came to the University of Virginia 30 years ago from the California Institute of Technology, where he was the Dreyfus Professor of Humanities. He had already established his standing as one of the world's leading authorities on 19th and 20th century poetry and as one of the foremost practitioners and theorists of the difficult art of scholarly editing. His time at the university has been marked not only by significant scholarly accomplishments, but by devotion to his students, both graduate and undergraduate, and by a remarkable commitment to service of the academic community at the university and beyond. University librarian John Unsworth wrote this about Mr. McGann. Like Jefferson himself, Jerome's interests are both wide-ranging and deep. He has immersed himself at different points in his career in 19th century British poetry, editorial theory, postmodern literature, textual criticism, modernist poetry, and most recently in the earliest records of America's colonization by Europeans. As a scholar, Mr. McGann is the author of prize-winning articles and books. A few highlights include the Melville Kane Award from the American Poetry Society in 1973 for his scholarship on Charles Algernon Swinburne, the Distinguished Scholar Award from the Keats Shelley Association of America in 1989, the Distinguished Scholar Award from the Byron Society of America also in 1989, and the Wilbur L. Cross Medal from Yale University Graduate School in 1994, which recognizes distinguished achievements in scholarship, teaching, academic administration, and public service. In 2002, Mr. McGann was the recipient of three major awards, the Richard W. Lyman Award for Distinguished Contributions to Humanities Computing, the James Russell Lowell Award from the Modern Language Association for radiant textuality as the most distinguished scholarly book of the year, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Distinguished Achievement Award. Mr. McGann has been elected to membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. 
Mr. McGann's contributions range far beyond the production of prize-winning scholarship. He has been a mentor to many fellow scholars and students. His graduate students speak especially warmly of his influence on their projects and their careers, and his undergraduate teaching is as renowned as his scholarship. He has been at the center of some extraordinarily generative cooperative enterprises, such as the Institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities, the digital scholarship project known as NINES, Spec Lab, the Rossetti Archive, and the Ivanhoe Project, all of which helped secure UVA's position as an international leader in digital humanities. Among the multitude of his publications are seminal pieces on pedagogy and on the place of the liberal arts in our culture. His course evaluations provide abundant evidence that students consider Mr. McGann an innovative and inspiring teacher. More than that, he is someone who has thought long and deeply about curricular design. When his scholarship was the subject of three seminars this past year at Cambridge University's Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities, Mr. McGann himself was asked to give a lecture that would speak to his lifetime of scholarly achievement. And so he did, lecturing not about the milestones in his brilliant scholarly career, nor about his current favorite project, but about the ethical call of humanistic scholarship and the duties of scholars who are privileged to give themselves to such work. Typically, his defense of the humanities was not about an abstraction, but about what humanistic scholarship does to those who practice it and what it does for the world. Mr. McGann challenges his students and grows along with them in ways that contribute immeasurably to the quality of academic life at UVA. His work sets an example of rigorous and innovative critical engagement, and his interactions with students and colleagues inspire the kind of passionate engagement and collaboration for which Jefferson's Academical Village was founded. In recognition of these contributions and his dedication to the university, it gives me great pleasure to present the Thomas Jefferson Award recognizing excellence in scholarship to Jerome McGann. At this time, I ask Mr. McGann to come forward to receive the award. President Sullivan, Board of Visitors, colleagues, faculty. When I got up this morning, I hadn't planned to say anything much besides thank you very much for this remarkable honor. But then NPR came on and pulled me back to the way we live now. And I realized I had to say something about why scholarship and scholars are so important for the community at large, perhaps especially today. What I want briefly to speak about is an assistant professor of Greek and Latin at Harvard College. His name was Milman Parry. He died young. He was 33. In 1934, the year before he died, he delivered an address to the Harvard Board of Overseers. The talk carried an extremely unprepossessing unprepo title, The Historical Method in Literary Criticism. Parry delivered it because he was troubled by a crisis in culture. He spoke out of an acute consciousness of the importance of that year, 1934, when he reminded the board propaganda and confusion were taking such hold of bewildered people throughout Europe and America. Stalin had recently consolidated his programs for the Soviets. 
Hitler for the Weimar Republic in 1933, and unregulated capitalist speculation had plunged the United States into a tormented social condition. Parry reflected on that situation in these words. The chief emotional ideas to which men seem to be turning at present are those of nationality, for which they exploit race and class. Anyone who has followed the history of the use of propaganda for political purposes, with its extraordinary development of intensity and technique in the past 50 years, recognizes how those who are directing that propaganda expressed their lack of concern and even their contempt for what actually was so and what actually had been so. Parry went on quietly to suggest that the humanistic tradition had something important to contribute to those benighted times. He was well aware how insignificant, how pedantic such academic pursuits may appear to people enspelled by the propaganda of anger and fear. So Parry urged the Board of Overseers to remember the scholar's fundamental article of faith, that there is nothing at the same time more fine and more practical than the truth. That would be the truth as such, the commitment we make to be accurate, to be thorough, to be, most of all, honest. The strength of those commitments and therefore their practicality rests in how out far and how in deep they go. They are commitments to something at once impossible and imperative, something we will never have and never know and never stop seeking after. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I think everyone here realizes that no scholar could expect to be chosen for an award such uh, as I am receiving here today. Because the award only singles out some person, in fact, some one of us, a community of scholars I've been lucky enough to be a part of for most of my life. Besides, we know that each year this honor comes to remind us, all of us, all of this community, about what the university believes in, ideals of individual and community enlightenment, and even more, the people committed to those ideals, the people of this university who get them. So finally, may I also say, it's something I shall never forget, that our community of colleagues and scholars this year have asked me to accept this honor in their name, in your name. Thank you. It is now my privilege to announce that the Thomas Jefferson Award Committee has selected Robert Bob Sweeney, former Senior Vice President for Advancement, to receive the Thomas Jefferson Award recognizing excellence in service. Let me read the citation. Bob Sweeney came to the university in 1991 as Vice President for Development. It was a time of budget shortfalls in Richmond and eroding state support for higher education in Virginia. The governor called for retrenchment in higher education and even in a speech at the university suggested that the faculty cease pursuing research. The response from the university community, faculty, the board of visitors, the alumni, was an overwhelming refusal to retrench and a determination to sustain and further strengthen the university. The two immensely successful capital campaigns that Mr. Sweeney devised and ran for the university were the centerpieces of those efforts. The first campaign raised $1.43 billion and the second raised $3 billion. Upon completion of the first campaign, 
Mr. Sweeney was promoted to Senior Vice President for Development and Public Affairs in 2000. When the $3 billion goal for the second campaign was announced, it was greeted with some skepticism. At that time, a campaign of that magnitude had never been undertaken by a public institution. In spite of challenges that included the most significant financial crisis since the Great Depression, Mr. Sweeney and the campaign chair, Gordon Rainey, a former rector of the university, persevered and the goal was met. This achievement placed the university's campaign in the top 10 of all capital campaigns ever completed. Former UVA President John Castine stated that the two campaigns signaled two great intentions to serve the public interest in new ways not previously seen here or in other flagship public universities and to build excellence on a new endowment equal to the university's new needs and appropriate to support more expansive missions beyond anything attempted before. To fulfill these aspirations, Mr. Sweeney recruited and trained a first-rate professional staff, and working with them, he devised the working plans for the first campaign and later for the second. As another of his nominators said, no chief development officer in any university has accomplished what Bob has achieved during his years in the position. His accomplishments simply set the mark for all who come after him anywhere in American higher education. Mr. Sweeney's achievements at UVA have brought him national recognition. As one nominator stated, Bob's leadership and service go significantly beyond raising support for UVA. He represents UVA nationally, and UVA's reputation has been elevated because of the service he has performed in his national community. He is a nationally regarded speaker on the role of and changes in philanthropy changing our society. He crafted and established an engagement structure for alumni, parents, and friends, providing innovative mechanisms for them to participate in the life of UVA. Mr. Sweeney and his wife, Lily, live in Pavilion 6 on the East Lawn, and they've made their house a center not only of the lawn community, faculty and students alike, but of life in the greater university community. Another nominator who has been a frequent visitor in Pavilion 6 commented that Bob's home was always open to those visiting UVA, and many friendships and engagement of students, parents, alumni, and friends of UVA begin with conversations in the relaxed setting of his pavilion. Through the years, Mr. Sweeney has worked quietly behind the scenes to achieve the goals that are best for the university. Another nominator said, he never puts himself on a pedestal or out front, and that he has been committed to the mentoring and cultivation of the next generation of development officers and leaders. Still another nominator stated that Bob is and has been a visibly honest, gentle, working man one whose life reflects the university's values, even as his accomplishments have opened up new futures for all of us. In recognition of these contributions and his dedication to the university, it gives me great pleasure to present the Thomas Jefferson Award, recognizing excellence in service to Bob Sweeney. At this time, I ask Mr. Sweeney to come forward to receive the award. For 25 years, I watched Thomas Jefferson uh, Award recipients cross the stage. Uh, these were my mentors, my colleagues, and my friends. People like Leonard Sandridge, Larry Sabato, Ed Ayers, and John Castine represented the very best in university leadership and scholarship. When prior award winners are taken into account, they are going to 
be major contributors to the modern history of the University of Virginia. My path to the podium has been quite different. Uh, I am an ensemble player. Uh, any success that I've had is the result of the team that has surrounded me. When I, when I think about the, the future, when I think about what's been accomplished, when I think about the people who've come before me, we all have one thing in common, a deep, deep love for the University of Virginia. So for this honor, uh, for making many of the dreams of my life come true, I will always be in its debt. Thank you so much. I have some announcements about activities that are planned for today and for the remainder of Family Weekend. Intermediate Honors recipients may pick up their certificates immediately after the ceremony in the entry foyer. At 4 o'clock today, the Class of 2018 Ring Ceremony will take place here in the John Paul Jones Arena. This year's keynote speaker is Steve Huffman. Mr. Huffman is a UVA alumnus receiving his Bachelor of Science degree in 2005. He is the co-founder and CEO of the social networking website, Reddit. Tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m., I will speak to parents in the old Cabell Hall Auditorium. I'll talk about the need for a new generation of strong ethical leaders in our country and how UVA is preparing your students to assume those positions of leadership. After my remarks, we'll have a Q&A period with several university leaders. Today and tomorrow, many events, open houses, and receptions will take place on the grounds. Please refer to the Family Weekend event schedule for times and locations for all events this weekend. We added some events after printing up the schedule, so the most up-to-date schedule is on the Family Weekend website which is at www.virginia.edu forward slash family weekend. Lasting much of the day tomorrow is Culture Fest 2016. Culture Fest is a student-run festival featuring an international bazaar of performances, foods, and arts and crafts. Performances will take place in the amphitheater. Students, faculty, and staff have worked for several months to plan this weekend's events, and we hope you will participate in as many activities as you can. It means a great deal to us to have you here at the university. Thank you for coming, and enjoy the weekend. <laughs>